Two guys, two continents, two missionaries, one gospel. You're listening to the Truth Be Known podcast with your hosts, Nathaniel Jolly and Bill Issa. Okay, for you guys out there who are listening to our podcast and you're thinking about doing your own, uh, just real quick in 30 seconds, let me give you a heads up. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it is the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. In 30 seconds here, it's absolutely free. They have creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer, which is awesome. Anchor will also distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, and many more. Also, you can make money from your podcast, which is exactly what I'm doing right now, in 30 seconds with no minimum listenership. It's an awesome place to do your podcast. It's everything you need all in one place. So download the free Anchor app or you can go to anchor.fm to get started. Super easy. If you're thinking about doing a podcast, go check it out. So without further ado, we'll jump right into our content. So welcome back to Truth Be Known Podcast. I'm Nathaniel Jolly. I'm Bill Issa. So we've got, just like every other podcaster for the past two weeks, we've got a special podcast for you. And as you can already guess, we're going to be talking about the situation that's developed around the death of Mr. George Floyd, particularly just kind of racism in general, social justice, Marxism, particularly how all those things affect the church. But before we really get started, I I just want to again reiterate that I am here with my brother from the same mother, although he's African and I'm American because we both came from one mother and that is Eve. Eve, yeah. And uh, I love this guy and I think just hold on to your seats while you listen to this podcast because your senses may be blown a little bit. Fair warning, neither one of us are politically correct, and so we don't mind if you're offended. We just hope that you'll submit to the Word of God as we also try to submit to the Word of God. Amen. Well, we haven't scripted this one like a lot of other guys. You've been watching the situation here in America. Your context is a little bit different, but I think you still see the effects of the same sin problem. What, what's your thoughts and opinions on what you're seeing, how you're seeing it affect the, the Church of Christ? Yeah, first of all, brother, um, I've been a bit amazed on how and why the death of George Floyd could just, I mean, raise all this dust. Because I've been following, obviously you've just said that uh, it's a bit different here in Africa. But I've been trying to, over the years, I've been trying to follow the, the, the racism or the, the segregation, racial segregation in, in, in the U.S. And uh, I've been seeing people, I mean, black Americans killed or dying, maybe by police officers, by this and that. And people could not just demonstrate on street like this and uh, when this one died george floyd and people went on street in masses the first first question came into my mind why how special was he who was george floyd if you know can you first i mean explain to me who was george floyd because me personally i did i didn't know that guy before i know i know you also might have not known him before but maybe you can be having more clue than myself. Can you please enlighten me on that? Who was this George Floyd? Yeah, George Floyd was a criminal. And I know I sure. automatically shocked people. But, you know, we, we have to deal with truth. And, and so let me finish that statement. You know, he was a criminal who um, had gotten pulled over by the police. He was arrested. He resisted arrest which led to some use of force. And, you know, what happened in that incident, and I, and I think every Christian looks at that situation and we recognize the injustice of it. We recognize what I think at this stage is a, a very clear abuse of power. 
And nobody is downplaying that. What happened to Mr. George Floyd should not have happened. It was an excessive use of force and his life was ended. But what we have to be careful of is automatically attributing his death to what people call racism. Now, first of all, there is no such thing as racism because we're all one race. There's only one race, the human race. Um, in terms of matter, you know, so we're talking about ethnic prejudice, right? But there were multiple police officers there and we just cannot say that what happened happened because the police officers somehow just hated black people. That, that's not truthful, it's disingenuous, and at best it's ignorant. Um, what happened was a police officer abused his authority and power, took the life of another individual, Mr. George Floyd, despite the fact that he was a criminal, he was an image bearer of God who did not deserve the treatment he received. And that, that alone is what we should be upset about, is the fact that he was an image bearer. Go ahead, brother. Yes, brother. Um I like I like what you just said. I, I I just enjoy it. You say, and we are not here to uh, to say that what that police white man did was right, it was good. We are condemning it. It was not good. But also, I want to add on that 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 alone. Okay, you 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 you've talked about it, but I'm just adding that the, the fact that that policeman put his knee on the, the neck of that guy does not mean that he did it because that guy was black. Why? Because in Africa here, in Uganda, our policemen do worse than that, even a hundred times to us. Let me repeat that. Many of our policemen in Uganda do to us, their fellow Ugandans and fellow blacks, things worse than that worse because that guy put his his knee on the neck of this guy and he suffocated and died that was very wrong indeed but our Afri our police uh, men in uganda here yeah, do to us worse than that and we do die even if i'm still alive personally but many people have died yeah so we, why can can we say that that is racism or what so that is just the issue of seeing as uh, Seen just as, as you just said, the, the policeman abused his authority, mm -hmm. he abused his power, just like yeah, he, he's, he's not the only one in, in Uganda, in, in Kenya, in Congo, in France, in, in the UK. People abuse their authorities and powers because of sin, yeah. And that's really the problem is it's a sin. And a lot of guys have done a great job of bringing that out. I want to get into some things that maybe haven't been brought out a whole lot. You know, as Christians, we have to be appalled at Mr. Floyd's treatment. And here's the thing. No one is minimizing that. And, and so you got a lot of guys out there who are saying, well, you're minimizing George Floyd's death by saying it's not racism. No, we're just being honest because we don't know that it was racism. In fact, I, I think exactly. what, what upsets me, and you know, brother, I'm probably going to get riled up because what upsets me is just the the utter lack of intelligent thought processes that go on in our culture. There were other officers there with him, and they were all of different ethnicities. So how can one say there there was an Asian guy there, there was a Latino police officer there there uh, if i'm not mistaken it was the black police officer that actually handcuffed floyd to begin with and and so are you telling me now that um well this gets into a whole nother bag i think i think my point is ultimately going to be christians need to just stop buying into whatever narrative the media wants to portray because what we see are pictures of the white cop and Mr. Floyd, and they've left out all of the other police officers. And the reason the media has left them out is because they aren't all white. One's Asian, one's Latino, one's black. Mm. If it had been four white officers, you'd see all four of their pictures. But because the other officers weren't white, you don't see any of their pictures. <coughs> you have to do a little bit of research. And so one thing that I really, really want to encourage believers is to just simply not believe everything the media shows you because at least our media here in the west and to be quite frank i think this is worldwide 
generally speaking, the media are anti-God people and they're portraying a political view that they have or they're portraying the bits and pieces that would further their own narrative. And the narrative that the media wants to portray in our country is that there's a race war. And there, there is not a race war, but but they're trying to make one. And unfortunately, I would say they're, they're doing a good job of stirring that up. I wanna move forward a little bit, brother. I wanna talk about Black Lives Matter as a movement. I wanna talk about, the big thing I wanna talk about, you and I are both missionaries. I want to talk about the impact that this stuff may have on missionaries around the world because missionaries tend to not get involved in anything that has a political smell to it. Uh, And there's a lot of reasons for that, but I'm not one of those guys. I am happy to speak up against wrong. And when the church starts adopting godless ideologies such as social justice, which is just a form of Marxism, by the way, and we'll get into that, then I, I want to speak up. And so hope that maybe in the course of this we can enlighten some pastors who may actually be putting their missionaries in danger on the field. Sure, sure. So let, let's talk about Black Lives Matter. You preached a sermon on Sunday and you made a couple strong statements about Black Lives mm-hmm. Matter. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I, I really uh, don't agree with uh, that. Or I, I really disagree because to me personally, uh, that that's really a movement that the enemy the devil is trying to use to 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 fight the gospel. Yeah, but because, you're black, uh, brother. How can you disagree with Black Lives Matter? Yeah, because, brother, the, the name the name of the group itself is really putting them down. Because if you tell me that Black Lives Matter, what about other lives? Because we know that if they want to separate lives, then they know that, that theirs is black, then there is white black, Latino black, I mean... Uh, white life, Latino life, and uh, I mean Asian life. So if they want uh, black lives to matter, what about all those other lives? That's why me, I, I would be with them if they were saying life matter, mm. matters, mm. or all lives matter. But if when you come just with black life matter, immediately to me, brother, I cannot be in with you because the the fact I know very well that the color of our skin is just on top here. You followed my my sermon. I really showed people how we we are born the same, we live the same, we eat the same, we die the same, we rot the same. Mm. And I I was asking people to show me any difference anywhere. So if you want to just uh, come and show me the difference on the, the color of the skin, then you are not fair. So that's why me personally really, and I appeal to, to my fellow Christians in that sermon to never even go closer to that so-called Black, black Lives Matter. Mm. Not even going closer. Yeah, so because I don't be, I, to me, I see them as really a force, a movement that is coming to oppose or to fight the gospel that I'm preaching for Christ. Yeah, that's a good point, brother. And, you know, I want to say, I, I hope that by the end of this Uh, podcast that every believer would actually be ashamed to use the terminology Black Lives Matter because it in and of itself as a believer demonstrates that there is a division in the body of Christ solely based on your skin color and that is anti-Christ. It is. And you know while we're talking about Black Lives Matter I think people A lot of people have just heard the term and they don't realize that it is actually an organization, right? So uh, you can go to their website and you can read the things they stand for. Let me just read a couple quotes from their own page. So if you're a believer and that's our audience, right? Before you say, before Black Lives Matter comes out of your mouth again, let me just let you know what you are actually supporting by supporting the rhetoric and the cause of that group. This is directly from their website, and I quote, We foster a queer affirming network. When we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking or rather the belief that all in the world are heterosexual unless she slash he or they disclose otherwise. So let me just tell you, if you support Black Lives Matter, you are supporting the promotion of homosexuality. 
It could not be any clearer. How can a believer join with that kind of thing? I can't believe that really they, these guys can can just say something like that. That is, it's too strong. They are, they are standing against heterosexual whatever. And uh, here, I, I've got two more quotes from them because people really need to understand if you're going to use their language, if you're going to march, and I'm not talking about, you know, the worldly protesting. I'm talking about Christians who are joining Black Lives Matter in these protests, in these marches, in these riots, in a lot of cases. This is what you're supporting. Uh, another quote from their own website, we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another, especially our children, to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable. Now, in case you're listening and you didn't catch the problems with that statement, let me help you. Number one problem, there is no such thing as a Western prescribed family structure. So what are they talking about? This is what they're against. They're talking about the traditional family structure that happens to be demonstrated in American history, which is this, one man, husband, mm -hmm. one woman, wife, and children in a hierarchy, patriarchal structure that is the man being the head of the household, the woman being the husband's helpmate, and the children who are submitted to both parents, that is a God-ordained family structure, not a Western family structure. But this is what they say they are against and what they want to tear down. So what they're communicating is that they are rebelling against God's ordained family structure. Problem two, if you notice, Maybe someone, before you continue, maybe someone would, uh, someone in Africa would say that maybe the, the, they're turning against type of family in Africa, in, in the U.S. and want to, 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 to make, to bring it to the way we live in Africa. You know, here we live in the, ex I, I, I heard them, I heard you say something like extended family, whereby we don't just simply consider father, mother, and children as a family, but in Africa also consider uncles and nephews and what. You get the point? So that's extended family, and maybe versus the, the just uh, uh, American family of father, mother, and children. I don't know, maybe some people in Africa could think that way. Can you shed more light on that one? What they're doing is trying to eliminate the part of husband, wife, children. So even in America, traditionally speaking, as believers, we understand, I mean, we have the phrase, it takes a village to raise a kid. And, and what we understand by that is that the whole body of Christ, right, joins in in, in healthy Christian community in raising kids, but they want to break all of this down. That's a good question. Let me go to the second problem with their sentence structure, because look, someone took the time to deliberately write exactly what they wrote. And so we need to understand what they wrote. Here's the second problem. If you'll notice what they basically did was eliminated a family structure by introducing tribalism, which takes away authority, God given authority from the parents, even in Africa, while the community may speak into the raising of children, it is the mother and the father that will stand before God for the raising of those children, not the community. Yeah, very, very right. And this is what they're breaking down, and they're breaking it down not by a Christian community, but by a community based solely on skin color. The last thing that I would say about this particular paragraph is that they specifically left out the mention of a father. Did you catch that? Let me read their sentence again. Yeah, sure. Right? Mm. It says, they go through and they say, especially our children to the degree that mothers, mothers are mentioned mm. specifically, parents, right, mm. and children. They didn't specifically mention fathers. They left them out. Yes. And they will say, well, but we said parents. Well, parents would include mother and father. So why did they specifically mention mother and they left out father? If they wanted to, after saying parents, they would have even left the mother out the way they left father out. Exactly. But you say parents and mother, but you don't ask mother and father, yeah. So there's no way to get around the fact that what they're fighting is not a Western family structure. It's a God 
family structure. Mm. That's what they're fighting against, right? One, one more thing, and, and that, and as a believer, if you're supporting this group, that is what you're supporting. You're supporting homosexuality. You're supporting the destruction of godly family. And this is another one. And I quote, we are self-reflexive and do the work required to dismantle cisgender privilege. And we'll talk about what that is. And uplift black transgender folk now they say black trans folk especially black trans women who continue to be disproportionately impacted by trans antagonistic violence so they're advocating for transsexuality That's a tough one they're advocating for transsexuals now what's cisgender cisgender right simply means that you agree with your biological sex. So they want to dismantle the idea that God created you male and that you understand that you're a man because God created you, ma you're, you male and that you live your life and function according to the way God designed you. They want to dismantle that. Yeah. How can a believer support that? How can a believer support the promotion of okay black trans women now honestly it's so absurd i can never remember is this a woman that's trying to be a black man or a black man trying to be a black woman i can't remember but it's absurd in both directions <laughs> i think it means it's a yeah. black man who wants to be a black woman mm -hmm. so if you're supporting black lives matter as a christian you're supporting transsexuality, you're supporting homosexuality, and you're supporting the destruction of the family unit. Is that really what Christians can support? Brother, you say these these quotes are found on their website? Directly if anyone on their can own go there website. And find them there? You can go there and find them yourself. Yeah. And then why under the sun a Christian, a believer can go can really support such a group? Let me be about as kind as I can possibly be here and say, I do think that a lot of Christians are just simply extremely ignorant, both of scripture and of what these groups really represent. You can go to their website and you can find these quotes and, it, and you just as a believer can't be happy to support this kind of thing. So maybe someone out there says, well, I'm not in line with all of the homosexuality and all of the family destroying stuff, but I still want to say Black Lives Matter because there's systemic racism in our country and I'm just trying to express that Black Lives Matter. But I, I think as you well have said, the implication of saying Black Lives Matter, whether you agree or not, by implication, what you're saying is that Black Lives Matter more than every other life, which should be problematic for a Christian because all lives matter. And so it, it is not unfair or inappropriate to respond to people by saying, well, actually, no, Black Lives don't matter, all lives matter. That is an appropriate biblical response. Because the reason lives matter have zero to do with your skin color. And let me just offend people here. The fact that you're black means absolutely nothing at all whatsoever. You're not valuable because you're black. You're not valuable because you're white. You're not less valuable because you're black. The fact that you're black has nothing to do with your value. Your value comes from the fact that you're made in the image of God. Now, you can rejoice in the fact that God's given you more melanin, and you should rejoice in that. But here's the flip side of the coin. You should also equally rejoice if you look like me and God gave you less melanin. And the reason is, the very moment you decide that you're more valuable because of your skin color, or that you're less valuable because of your skin color, basically you shake your fist at God and you say, why have you made me this way, God? You were wrong. Exactly. That's why I said really that uh, when a Christian really supports such movements, they are really going against God himself. Let's just talk about all these churches now who are adopting this. So this whole mindset comes from the teachings of social justice. Now, a lot of guys get confused when you say the word social justice because what they hear is justice. And they think, oh, justice is good, mm -hmm. right? That is not what social justice means. Social justice yeah. is cultural Marxism. We don't get to redefine what social justice is. And a lot of guys, a lot of Christians 
are trying to redefine that term, but that term has a set definition already. You don't get to change it. The academic world, when you say social justice, everybody understands what you mean. And what they understand you to be saying is a justice system that is built on the redistribution of power, of wealth, and of tangible goods from those who are considered an oppressive class to those who are considered an oppressed class. Social justice, it is tantamount to theft. Social justice is the idea of stealing from one group of people so that you can redistribute it to another group of people that you've deemed oppressed. That means that if you're white and you are a male, you are an oppressive group of people. And that is solely based on your skin color. And that is racist. It's ironic that the system is actually racist because it groups a bunch of people together based solely on their skin color and tries to make them feel bad because they have less melanin than another group of people. So we don't get to, as believers, so let, to redefine those definitions. Let, let us first, first help them because the word justice is found in scripture. And, and some of them are trying to hide behind that. Let's first try to, to, I mean, tell them what does that word justice means when it appears in scripture? How do yeah. you understand it? I'm, I'm going to, to come up with my own version of understanding. Yeah, when we talk about, and, and this is where the conversation has to go. Too many Christians are buying into the world systems with no thought to what the biblical understanding is. So, uh, first rule of thumb is if you have to put a descriptor on the word justice, you're already wrong, right? There, there's no social justice. There's no black justice, white justice. As a believer, there's just justice. And justice, just, yeah. justice right, is what God says it is, and it's equal across all of humanity regardless of your skin color, based on right and wrong as defined by God himself. So if you are a white man and you murder another white man, injustice has been done, right? Wrong has been done. If you are a black man and you murder another black man, you're wrong. If you're a white man and you murder a black man, you're wrong. If you're a black man and you murder a white man, you're wrong. And they're all wrong equally across the board because it is a sin problem. Now, what we're not saying is that sin doesn't express itself ever in the form of ethnic prejudice or what people call racism. That does happen, but nobody is denying that. But what we are saying as Christian thinkers and leaders is that you can't just automatically attribute a motive to a situation just based on the skin colors involved. You can't do that, right? We don't have proof that what happened to Mr. Floyd happened because of anybody's skin color. We don't have proof of that. And so you can't impugn motives as a believer. It is actually sinful to impugn motives without evidence. Yeah. So already- yeah, I, I, like, I like- Go ahead, brother. I like what you, uh, you are just you saying that uh, in the Bible, the word justice stands alone. That is very beautiful. It, 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 God does not want us to have social justice or male justice or white or black. It is just justice. We need to show justice to people. And personally, I understand justice as it's more or less something like uh, love your neighbor as you love, your, uh, as you love yourself. In other words, so, so you you need to be to show justice even to your to your to your uh, maid servants. If you promise them to pay their salary, first of all, give them salary that goes with the work they are doing for you, and pay them that salary in time. So just show justice to people. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so now, if we we try to use that word justice the way the the Bible portrays it, then. The people of social justice are not do, do not have justice because they are, they want to lift the black race above other races. So that's not justice because justice is you need to just love others as, as you said. If you kill someone, if you hate someone, that's not justice. So basically, what you're saying is that social justice system is actually racist itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 obviously. 
Yeah. But anyone who understands well, really, you'll see clearly that social people are fighting for social justice, are just fighting for racism. Continue, Brad. Yeah. And when you say fighting for racism, you're saying they're promoting racism, you know? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, let, let me just actually read the definitions back to back of justice and social justice. We really need to grasp that these words have firm definitions and they are not the same, right? So if you're, you know, when pastors get in the pulpit and they start talking about social justice, they are not talking about something biblical. The definition of justice is this, and it's very simple. It means just behavior or treatment without respect for color, class, person. So you know what? The, the, the super poor guy who breaks into a house and steals something receives the same condemnation as if it's a rich person who breaks in the house and steals something. That's justice. Yeah. Now, let me read you the definition of social justice. And, and so our hearers can see. All right, social justice, this is the definition, the Oxford definition. Justice in terms of the distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society. Now, do those two things sound anything alike? No. No, no. So again, justice is just behavior or treatment. Social justice, justice in terms of the distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within society. You know, here's the real kicker, and maybe this is just going to blow some minds, but if you're born poor, it's because God wanted you to be born poor. If you're born wealthy, it's because God wanted you to be born wealthy. Because God is sovereign, and God's providence puts us in the place that we're in, and to try to just fight against that without acknowledging that God has a plan and purpose for that in your life is actually to judge God as being wrong. True. And that's going to be hard for a lot of people. But as Christians, we have to come back to the sovereignty of God, the providence of God, and we have to acknowledge that while we may not understand why we were born the way we were born or where we were born, we may not understand those things, but we have to say that ultimately it fit in God's plans and purposes for my life. And we have to submit to that and be thankful for God rather than in reality fight against God ultimately deeming God himself to be unjust. Because the moment you say, oh, I'm inherently racist because I'm white, what you've just done is judged God as being guilty of creating you white. Yeah, sure. Heaven forbid we ever do that, and yet it's happening all over America. Or someone believing that somehow they're of less value because they're black. You've just deemed God of being guilty of creating you less because of the amount of melanin in your skin. Heaven forbid we ever do that. I say, I like the, I want to quote this, this guy. I found him on, on the internet. I'm not fam very familiar with him, but uh, it's this Tom Ascol, I liked him so much. He, this is article on the internet was entitled, is, is there an evangelical social justice movement? It's a question. Is there an evangelical social movement? And yeah, let me just quote uh, something from him from this article. He says, the last few years, we've seen the ocean of the world begin to swamp the sheep of the Christian church. The devil has effectively enticed many churches to welcome godless ideologies into the environment. Mm -hmm. And he's done it through the Trojan horse of what is called social justice. The net effect is that these ideologies are undermining Christian teaching and taking Christians hostage. Oh, I like th those words from Tom Ascol. I don't know him personally, but I think he should be a pastor. But really, to be sincere, um, these are new ideologies and they are godless ideologies and they are really taking many Christians, uh, I mean, into captivity. People are Christian, I mean, Christian, it's taking them hostage into mm. them. And uh, really, uh, I like, was, I wanted to see how he, yeah. he yeah. was explaining social justice, and I liked just these uh, few uh, yeah. quotes from him. And then, then I said myself down there, from me, what I'm also uh, uh, opposing personally is a certain inspired worldliness that takes the form of various ideologies 
that have entered the church to distort and destroy historic Christianity by either replacing it with a new religion or convincing Christians to adopt World, world view elements inimical to historic faith claims and this threat is present active and significant mm. so from mm. oh brother just continue from i want i was just quoting from this other guy that i think i don't know do, do you know him thomas Cole? yeah yeah and so this is a good place to actually do a little plug for tom askell and his ministry i'm i'm familiar with him Tom Askell is a dear brother in the Lord. He's a, a pastor of a church in Florida. And, and let me just say for our listeners, he did an entire video on this mm. kind of thing. It's called By What Standard? If you have not seen that synodoc, go watch it. I'll make sure that we link to that synodoc in, in the show notes for this podcast. But Tom Askell is also the director of Founders Ministries. It is an incredible ministry. Tom is one of those guys who is out there fighting for the faith, fighting uh, for the sake of the bride of Christ um, against all of these godless worldly ideologies that are trying to creep into the church. He loves the bride of Christ. He loves the church. He loves the brethren. Just an amazing source uh, to go to. And so we'll, we'll link both his ministry and the synodoc that they put together talking about social justice it's really good so that it's a it's pretty awesome that you found that quote on your own not knowing anything about tom or his ministry uh dear brother in the lord though i mean this is the problem with so much in the church right now we have a lot of pastors who are getting caught up in emotionalism and look i i get it i i've been there myself get caught up in the emotionalism occasionally we all do that but we've got to step back Rather than wanting to attach ourselves to the Republican Party or the Democrat Party or any kind of worldly system, we've got to step back and say, first and foremost, I am a citizen of heaven and I've got to judge things biblically. And if I need to cut ties with anything that I've joined to in the world, then that's what's got to happen. And a lot of pastors aren't doing that. They aren't stepping back. They aren't saying what's biblical ethics here. They're, they're just getting caught up in the motion, in the emotions. What, to be quite frank, too many Christians watch too much TV, too much news, constantly taking this in and getting caught up in the world system. Look, I've been, I've been watching pastors who are marching alongside Black Lives Matter, who are marching alongside Antifa guys, who is a terrorist organization, by the way. Pastors who are, I mean, this blows my mind. I'm just not giving anyone the benefit of the doubt right here. I watched a church, so-called church service, where the pastor and all of his white congregation members got on their hands and knees in a bowing posture before all of the black members of the church. It looked like they were worshiping all the black members of the church, and they were repenting for being white, basically. No, that that's, that that's, should not be a church, really. <laughs> what are they doing? That's a good question, brother. What on earth are you thinking? If you're a pastor and you're having your people do that, it's time for you to resign, get out of your pulpit, go find a healthy biblical church and learn what scripture teaches about these things because you are doing nothing but sowing division in your church based solely on skin color and you're doing the work of satan himself within your own church sure, sure. i agree with that. and i i mean because what, what disturbs me again brother we all this thing of uh, black lives matter and you say that you've seen the pastors also marching with sinners on street Brother, where have they been when many black lives are, are, are being murdered every day in, in the U.S. in abortion? They kill children every single day, brother. When I read that on the internet, I feel really, I can't believe it. But why don't they march? Black lives are being murdered in those clinics, abortion clinics in the U.S., but they don't march. Mm. But to today to hear from you that even the pastors are marching because of just one, I don't say that 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 one life of George Floyd is not life. It is life and it's valuable because he was creating the image of God. 
but you cannot compare one life with all these many thousands of lives that moreover of black children also that are murdered mm. in those mm. clinics but they don't match mm. and it stops to my mind man. and that's a valid point so if black lives really mattered why do we still have abortion clinics everywhere in our country yeah. and and it's not just thousands it it's millions and here's the thing planned parenthood the abortion clinics disproportionately mm. murder more blacks than whites more black people sure. are murdered by planned parenthood and i do mean murdered by planned parenthood mm. than anything else in our country combined mm. but i don't see people marching against planned parenthood in fact antifa supports planned parenthood black lives matter supports planned parenthood and the democrat party supports planned parenthood So just tell sure. me how can a Christian join with any of those organizations or groups and I'm not trying to be political I'm just trying to be biblical here how can you say black lives matter mm. when all of these groups support planned parenthood who kill more black babies than anything else in our country mm. I just don't know how you can do it Yeah our country has exploded and to be honest I think a lot of people are looking at what's happening in the US and they're becoming afraid they're getting anxious they're kind of wondering what's going on and so let me just interject you know right here that god is still sovereign god is in the midst of all this he's not yeah. lost control he's sitting on the throne god's church is not going to be overthrown but we still have to deal with sin that's creeping in the church we still have to deal with the fact that pastors are now teaching their congregation members that basically if you're white you have an extra sin burden and they're teaching their black members that somehow they're automatically a victim because of their skin color both of those things are absolutely wrong virgil walker and and daryl harris do a podcast called just thinking it is out of this world amazing podcast those two brothers are right on Virgil in one of their recent ones talks about how white pastors in our country are treating black parishioners as though they're perpetual victims. He goes on to say that th that type of behavior is equivalent to ecclesiastical abuse. And, yeah. and I want to agree with him. If you're a pastor, whether you're black or white, it doesn't matter and you're teaching your congregation that if you're black, you're a victim, if you're teaching your congregation that if you're white, you're inherently racist you're abusing your people it's ecclesiastical abuse and mm -hmm. it, if you can't see that if you're unwilling to see that if you're unwilling to take a step back and judge these things biblically then it's time for you to resign as a pastor because you have utterly failed the position of shepherding your flock in a godly biblical manner mm -hmm. i mean the reality is and i you know i i, I kind of joked uh and said that you're my brother from the same mother is true we're all from adam and eve we're one family we're one race and as christians you know the, the moment we come into relationship with christ our old man dies away um we're created new we're we're we become one family in god in fact i i just want to read this because this is something that clearly this is scripture that's being ignored and i need to just turn there i'm going to go to galatians 3 and 28 um yeah because it's it's clearly being ignored by all these social justice pastors um and 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 it's evidence and this is how i can say with certainty that if you're picking up social justice you've just left the scriptures mm. and give me just a second brother i've got to flip i got to turn there but it says so galatians 3:28 i'm going to back up just a little bit 3:28 i'm going to start from 3:25 It says but now that faith has come we are no longer under a tutor for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek now let me just stop right there when Paul wrote this you need to understand that there could be no greater difference than the difference between a Jew and a Greek far greater a difference than the difference yeah. between light skin and dark skin 
And he's saying that that difference that God himself originally designed, because God picked the Jewish people to be a people of his own. He separated Israel from every other people. And now he's saying that here in Christ, there are no longer Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. Another huge distinction. There is neither male nor female. Another huge distinction. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs, according to the promise. If you were, I asked myself. Yeah, I go ahead, myself, brother. Can they preach from that, that, that scripture, from that passage? If, yes, they can preach, what can they say? Whoever, I mean, whoever is supporting the, this movement, the social justice and Black Lives Matter, can they, okay, obviously our podcast is not really looking at the, the pagans and the worldly people because they have all the rights of, of being on, on streets. We are focusing on the church, the, the, the house of God, the so-called born-again people. So now if you say you're a pastor, and you, you, you support these movements. Can you preach from Galatians 3.28? If yes, I, I'd like to know which explanation. I'd like to, to read you the script of your sermon. What could you say? How could you apply? So also here, Brother James, chapter 2. I want also to read James chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. James chapter 2. These, these are some of the, the passages of Scripture that are, I, I don't know what they can say if they decide to preach from them. The, 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 yeah, James says, if you really fulfill the, the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. Nine. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. You see, so you need to, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. But if you start showing partiality and i see this clearly with the social justice group or movement they are trying to, sh to show partiality by mm -hmm. these pastors who are asking their church members white to go and kneel before their bl black br brethren and apologize or do this and that but they are showing partiality mm -hmm. and if they are showing partiality according to scripture they commit sin and they are convicted by the law as transgressors. You can't preach from the Bible and preach social justice. You've got to throw one of them out. And oh, exactly. Those are your two options. And let me just say, you know, I've said this on my Twitter, my Facebook, you know, followers come and go on those things and I could care less how, how popular, how many followers I have, but I will die before I get on my hands and knees before any other human being. God alone gets that nobody else yeah. i can't fathom seeing a person having to get on their hands and knees before another human being because of their skin color and that's exactly what's happening and it's totally unacceptable again by implication and i think people don't think through what their actions and what their words imply if you have to apologize for your skin color or you have to say that you're better because of your skin color you are judging God, and this is the problem. Forget about my offense to you. Forget about my offense to someone else. You, you are shaking your fist at the living God as a clay vessel and saying, why have you made me this way? And that ought to be absolutely terrifying. Yeah. yeah. That the fact is, to buy into social justice, you have to judge the living God as being wrong. Mm. And also, when, as I was following uh, these uh, video clips from Brother uh, uh, Vody Bokam that you sent to me, in one of them, I liked really what he said. He says, even as they, they fight for social justice, they say whites are undermining them, are not sharing the wealth of the country equally with them. Then Brother said, when you go and analyze life their lifestyle very well you find that they they have a lot to blame in in them being what they are because sometimes when, when you other people are, are working for example and you, you are just lazy sleeping it's just an example 
and then that guy gets rich. Can you blame him? So, in other words, just in quotes, brother was saying, brother Vodi was saying that if you try to analyze, to go deep into why these blacks are like this and these whites are like that, these blacks have a big hand in what they hear, mm. in one way or the other. Maybe laziness, maybe not want, wanting to go to school, and many other reasons. I don't know, I'm not an American, so you can understand these things better than, than me, but he who lived on streets in Los Angeles, uh, Southern Los, Los Angeles, knows really the, very well that in one way or the other, they contribute, the, 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 the black people there contribute on them being what they are. He did not go into details, therefore I cannot also go into details. But but they are, they are still fighting for, for, for social justice, you know, they are stealing from us. I, I don't know, I don't understand just all the things. Well, I mean, brother, I think you hit a nerve there because what you're talking about is taking personal responsibility for your own actions. Yeah. Right. And instead of blaming others. And I mean, this is as Christians, you know, we've got to think about this sort of thing. Um, are, are there injustices in the world? Absolutely. Nobody is arguing. Yes. Right. Yeah. There are injustices in the world, but but they aren't limited to one ethnic group of people. For instance, you know, brother, you live in a place where most people look just like you do. Mm. Right. I mean, the majority of the yeah. people where you live are dark, are black skinned, right? You, yeah, I mean, sure. God gave you a lot of wonderful melanin that gave you that rich black skin you have. And, and the mm -hmm. people around you look similar to you. And yet, if we're honest, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, but you guys in a lot of ways experience far worse injustices than what most Americans will ever experience. I, I, I talked about that. Um, that's very true. We experience a lot of injustices here. And also, if, if this group is uh, fighting for uh, the justice of black Americans, then I want just to show you that uh, if they want everyone to come out and, and uh, start fighting for uh, their social justice, then after fighting for their social justice as black black americans then we can also come out and and start also fighting for our social justice as black uh, black africans why am i saying this because brother i've interacted with a few uh, of my fellow black africans not black americans who have happened who, a few of those a few that have interacted with who have gone to the u.s and uh, brother i think I can agree with them that uh, the way black Americans look at us, black Africans there, is worse than the whites look at us. And oh. one even happened, yes, one even happened to, to tell one black African that, no, we, we hate you guys because you are the ones who sold us here. You are the ones who sold us to come. So we are going through all this because of you. In other words, whites, whites, in, in America, treat us black Africans better than our fellow black Americans. Did you get my point? So yeah. if, if they are fighting for, for social justice as black Americans, after after achieving their goal, then we can also come out and say, no, let us also, also start fighting for our social justice as black Africans against black Americans. Because according to a few people, and according to, to my little research, some, not all of them, I cannot generalize, but some really try to, to not look at us with uh, some good eye because they think that we are the ones mm -hmm. who sold them into that. Yeah. And so, so in other words, in other words, social justice will not end. While these people are fighting, they get their social justice, another group comes out. Mm -hmm. And they also start fighting for their social that women and, are there and they want equality with men and all these things, all these are social. So you see, it's all together just confusing. That's a great point, brother. And I think, uh, you know, we have an interesting dynamic. I'm a white American. You're a black African, right? Living in Africa. And, and we see that, you know, between the two of us living in the different continents, you see that if you take away the differences of skin color, you have exactly the same issues. It yeah. proves that 
Sin is the problem, not the skin color. You have tribalism in, in parts of Africa where, you know, everyone's black, so you can't blame it on your skin color. So the next thing sin does is say, well, our tribe is better than your tribe. You know, I, I mean, everyone's familiar. Most people are familiar with the Rwandan genocide. Yes. Well, so everyone was the same skin color in that ordeal. What was the, e the equal denominator was sin and hatred. And that's really the problem. And if pastors don't wake up here in America and start preaching the gospel, they're going to fail at getting to the heart of the issue because the issue is not some kind of systemic racism. Every white person in America, it, it not even close to being racist. The problem is sin and hatred that comes from it. In fact, you know, if you were to go back into history of just slavery, it's evident that people are ignorant because in America, typically people go back to as far as maybe, maybe the mid 1800s, but slavery existed far, far before that. And let me just tell you, for the majority of history, it hasn't been white people that's been involved directly in slavery. And I know that's going to offend people, but I don't actually care. You can't change history. The very first record we have of slavery, and by the way, w slavery is absolutely wrong, but you can't deny the history. The first recorded evidence we have of, of slavery was a family member selling another family member into slavery, right? Joseph was, was sold into slavery by his brothers. Right. Yes. Yes. And, and let me just tell you, if you understand where they were in the world, uh, they probably weren't white. <laughs> right. Mm. Probably were not white. So you move through history just a little bit further and you have the fact that Israel had slaves. They weren't white. Mm. You move up further in history, get into David Livingston's missionary journeys in Africa. And I've skipped a lot of history there, but just to cut it short, David Livingston when he was trekking through much of Africa, he ran across slave traders that were actually Middle Eastern. So you had Middle Eastern slave traders mm. who were being, now listen, being sold African slaves. Well, who were they being sold slaves by? Because there, there wasn't a lot of white colonization yet. The Middle Easterners were being sold African slaves by other Africans. So again, whites weren't involved in that. Who do you think sold the first slaves to the Europeans? Other Africans and Middle Easterners who weren't white. And so then you get into Europeans having slaves and things like that. But if we're just going to be brutally honest, which we need to be, for most of history, white people have not been involved in slavery. Now, I'm not excusing for the time period where they were to let me, let me, let me add, to let me the 1800s. Add yeah, go ahead, brother. Yeah, go ahead. We've, we've read books of history and those facts are there. That uh, I think in my sermon I say that I don't know, maybe if someone knows could really uh, uh, teach me that uh, any whites who came and started just chasing after black Africans and then chained them and took them. They were sold by us here for, for gain. Just and uh, you, you, you talked, you, you mentioned Steve, I think that that's now the, the climax of this episode of this, uh, this podcast because we want to show people that all this is just I mean, has got the, the foundation the root is seen, it is seen and uh, uh, when you talk of uh, people selling their own family members even these days, brother when they, they, they blame you whites for A, B, C, D uh, another one can want to want to blame you for uh, slavery but today as i'm talking right now we have what we call new or modern slavery and, and this is human trafficking mm. human trafficking we have a lot of it in in, in africa here in uganda here and this human trafficking who, who are, is it is it whites who are coming to to to, to sell their own brothers and sisters and parents to especially Arab countries, brother, that, that annoys me seriously in my country these days. Mm, mm. How many people are being sold into slavery in Saudi Arabia, in Dubai, in mm. Oman, in Qatar? Okay, they say, uh, and we, how many have died? How many Ugandans, how many Kenyans, how many Tanzanians have died because they are being mistreated there? Mm. But still, parents are the ones who are sending 
or selling their own children to these Arab countries. But mm. still, they, 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 they want to put the blame on other people. Mm. But that's what I, I don't want to really to entertain. But now, when, when you talk of sin, we need to people to understand, especially Christians in the church, that the root of everything that is going on in the world is sin. And I like when I followed that uh, podcast by Brother Daryl Harrison and, and Walker and Virgil, they, they said something here that I noted down and I liked it so much, brother. They say that Christians are, one, asking wrong questions about all these things, social justice and what they are asking wrong questions. And not only that, they are also going to wrong people for answers. Mm, mm, you know, mm. the question concerning social justice and blah, 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 blah. They're asking the wrong questions. And then they are going to wrong people for answers. Which wrong people are these? These wrong people, that they're, they're going to the media, they're going to to political leaders, etc., etc., and they want those to give them answers against social justice. Already, many of these people they are going to for answers are sinners. Mm. How, how do you expect really to get justice from a sinner? That cannot yeah. happen, yeah. brother. You can't really because you, you you are going to these politicians that you, you want them to give you justice. It cannot happen, really, brother. That cannot be stressed too much or too often because as Christians, I, I don't know how you, you and I both preach this regularly, brother. Sola Scriptura, Sola Scriptura, Sola Scriptura, yeah. Scripture alone, Scripture alone, Scripture alone. I mean, that has to be our source. We're having this problem in the church because believers no longer believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. And mm. rather than going to the Bible, Christians are going to the world. You know, that's a big part of this problem. So, And social justice has become, like Dr. Askell said, the Trojan horse that's crept into the church. And so the church is decided, and in fact, whole entities like the SBC in resolution number nine, actually adopts social justice, critical race theory, intersectionality as analytical tools, right? And so you have whole Christian organizations that have adopted godless worldly ideologies and brought them into the church and saying, hey, let's use these. You know, I so appreciate Tom for multiple reasons. Maybe one day I'll grow up and be a little more like him as he's like Christ. But uh, one of the things is he's constantly battling this in the SBC because it's all through the Southern Baptist Convention here in the United States. And he's one of the brothers on the forefront that very lovingly and tactfully saying, guys, wake up. You know, we can't do this. You know, I, I want to I read something in Acts before we, we move on and touch on a different subject here in our topic. But, you know, this is unscripted. So we're just kind of bouncing around things that we're seeing and that concern us. This scripture flies in the face of social justice. It's from Acts chapter 17, and it says this in verse 26. It says, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. We are all one nation in God. We all came from the same parents. I have been called racist and judged for my skin color more these last couple weeks than I have in many, many years. And, you know, the scripture here makes it clear that it's God who made an entire nation from one man. It's God who determines uh, where we live and what our boundaries are going to be. And if you buy into social justice, you just can't support that biblically. There's only one race. It's kind of like arguing the difference between the shades of green in plants. We both have melanin. You have melanin in you that makes your skin dark. I too actually have melanin. So we are exactly the same. The difference is you have a little more melanin, which to be quite frank, I'm a little jealous of because when I come to Africa, I'm gonna sunburn far easier than you, brother. <laughs> yes. We both have melanin. <laughs> I, I think it was uh, Virgil or Daryl that made the statement, we're all people of color. Yes, I'll, I agree with them. I am actually a person of color too, because there are no invisible people walking the earth today. Some just have more melanin. 
and so their skin is darker. Some have a little less melanin, and so their skin is lighter. I mean, this movement is just ridiculous, beyond ridiculousness. I, I want to get into another topic that I haven't heard anyone else talk about, and that's how the adoption of social justice or cultural Marxism into the church can negatively affect missionaries on the field. And this is something yeah. and dear to me. Um, I, I've been a missionary in a couple months, Lord willing. You and I will, for the first time, get to sit across the table from one another and do our podcast because I'm moving there to join you and the mm. work God has permanently. But but let's talk about how this can affect missionaries on the field because I don't think pastors are really considering that, and I understand. So I. I'm not going to put down pastors for not having considered it, but let's just put some stuff out there for pastors who are adopting social justice here to consider in terms of how it may affect missionaries on the field. Okay. Let me tell you a little bit about what I've already heard. Now, I'm not going to mention them by name because I don't want to give them any credit, but there's actually a hate group in your country, a, a racist hate mm. group who have picked up on social justice they're following and feeding into what what America is putting out in terms of social justice. And it's really caused them to attack white missionaries. I wanna say before we get started, mm -hmm. you're a church in America and you're a pastor and you're promoting social justice, you are likely jeopardizing the safety of your own missionaries who look like me in other countries. And you really need to consider that. That's so how is that happening? Well, for instance, this, this group that I'm not going to name publicly that is in your country, they've latched on to this idea that white people are systemically, are, are automatically racist based on their skin color. And, and so they're going around basically attacking white missionaries in your country who are doing things like running orphanages, saving African children, providing health care, providing church planning, providing education, who are working alongside Ugandans as brothers and sisters in Christ, and they're attacking them, taking them to court. This morning, before, I, I, before we started podcasting, recording this, I spoke to a lady who's also been attacked by this group of people, verbally attacked, had her character impugned all over social media, so much so that it really caused her emotional distress. And so when churches in America, they start teaching that white people are automatically guilty because of their skin colors, they're actually putting white missionaries in danger on the field. And let me just say, I wanna be as bold as saying this, if pastors here keep promoting that, eventually they're gonna get their own missionaries killed and they will be guilty for that blood spilled on the field. And they need to consider this. Yeah. What are your thoughts, brother? Speak to that because you see missionaries in, in your country. Can you see how that would be true and, and play out eventually as these groups become more violent? Yeah, that's very true, brother, because um, since this movement started a few weeks ago, I'm, I'm hearing re really many people here, especially obviously uh, wildly people, talking ill against whites, whites at large. Mm. They are feeling really, they're getting a headache over whites because of what they are hearing, especially from these pastors in different churches in the mm. U.S. And therefore, uh, I mean, therefore that, that is, is raising the level of, the, of hatred in them. Mm. They don't want to see them. Okay, you hear some even start saying that whites are not our brothers. So, and uh, as, I, as I told you before we started record, recording this, yesterday, Sunday morning, as I was just putting the last thoughts on my sermon, a radio was, uh, I mean, was on, and this pastor, one of the big pastors in this city, Kampala, has got mm. a radio station and a TV station was speaking to, to his radio station and he also uttered those words and saying, I, I, I've, I've been telling you always that white, any white is not your brother. They don't mean anything good for you. They don't plan anything. To, listen to he said, if you see even them come as missionaries to our countries here, they come for their own gain. Mm. They don't come for anything good. They just 
they don't they are not coming to help you they just they are coming to help themselves therefore know that they are not your brother they don't wish anything good mm. or to you mm. now imagine this guy has got a mega church and in that mega church he has got white members church members then i was asking myself i even told talk to my wife and said now what how, how are these black members of his church going to to treat those other members of his church who are white mm. if these members of his church who are white are following this radio broadcast how are they going to feel mm. so he isn't he going to cause even persecution to them the church, members of his own church so mm. brother what what you've raised is really very very serious because this social, social justice or black lives matter whatever what they are doing is just aiming to kill i mean missions mm. to kill because they, they, they are they are sowing the seed of hatred and black people here will not want to see white americans mm. they are going to cause many white americans it to be persecuted and even to be murdered mm. and that is not really mm. what we would like to see so they they need to repent if there is any pastor really who's behind mm. this he really needs to come out and repent openly mm. and start speaking against this mm. yeah tr- tr- truly speaking brother the lives of what missionaries are, is being put to danger here because of this movement mm. And as you say at the beginning the church of Christ will not be put down. Mm. It will be yeah. vain because yeah. he said I want to to build my church uh, and no no power from hell can prevail against yeah. it. Even missionaries will continue you are coming to Uganda. Yeah. Yeah. And many others those who are here and those who are planning to go anywhere they will continue because the work is the Lord and the world. This is yeah. my father's land as we call we we sing in our hymns. And you, yeah. you are free to go wherever you want to go and serve your God. I just want to reiterate what you said so the pastors here can get that. Already in your country, you have a mega church pastor who is telling over the radio, right, a large audience that white people, because of their skin, that they are not even Christian brothers. This is a pastor. who's grabbed a hold of social yeah. justice and now he's preaching yeah now he's preaching in Uganda that if you're white you're not a christian brother and and this is what i want our, our american pastors and churches to hear because this is what they are promoting this is what you're causing and you need to understand that if you're furthering the social justice rhetoric if you're furthering this cultural marxism you are risking the lives of missionaries in other countries and not only that you're causing other pastors to pick up on that and begin preaching that now because of your skin color if you look like me you're not even a brother in christ And I'm not doing this for publicity for myself because I'm moving over in a couple months, but you know, churches here need to understand that when you start promoting these things that they have an impact around the world and in many places around the world that don't quite function like the US, what you're doing is endangering missions. What you're in doing is putting missionary families their their very lives possibly in jeopardy. And we've got to take that serious. How can you send a missionary anywhere and then put that very missionary's life in danger how can you do that and yet it's happening already and very quickly so it's just something that pastors really need to consider you know ultimately brother when we look at social justice when we look at cultural marxism there just is nothing biblical that you can pull out of those movements they are worldly godless god hating movements for the christian we've got to step back we've got to cut ties with that if your church has bought into social justice cultural marxism lock stock and barrel you go through the right steps you know and i would say the steps are you go to your leadership you express concern you try to educate them you take them to scripture you do everything you can and at the end of the day your church becomes a social justice church it's time for you to go look somewhere else And I don't say that lightly. I say it with a heavy heart 
you know, give it time, try to give, try to educate your pastors. But at the end of the day, if you're in a church that is grabbing hold of the world and leaving the faithfulness of the scriptures, then it's time to go find a biblical church. We don't want people to be church hopping. That's not what I'm saying. I've been seeing Twitter posts of people saying, my church is going in support of Black Lives Matter. What do I do? Uh, but I don't see many answers to that question. And, and I think the answer is you confront it just like you would anything else, lovingly, patiently. And in the end, if your church becomes a social justice church, you're no longer in a biblical church. So go find somewhere else. Speak to that, Bill. What, what's your advice? You're pastoring a church there. What, how would you say that differently or better? Yeah, obviously, brother, that, 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 that's the point, reason why uh, yesterday I had to, uh, to, to come up with that sermon. Obviously, I did not preach it because of what is going on. It was already, I don't know, amazingly, I, I was talking to a few people here that it's providentially that it just... I was to preach that very message and uh, the things are just moving in your country the way they are moving. I can't be personally part of a church that is supporting social justice, to be sincere, because as you've just said, I have to try to make sure, I mean, to, to, to do whatever I can to, to reason them through scripture that Christians should not support social justice. And if I manage to win my, my brothers, I, I'll give glory to the Lord. If I fail, as, as you just said, really, I, I look for a biblical church that understands scripture. And so because uh, the fact that you are supporting social justice movement is enough to prove to us that we don't understand scripture very well. As, as I said, and our, our brothers uh, uh, said, Virgil and Darren, that uh, people are asking uh, wrong questions to wrong people and are going to wrong people for answers. Maybe we should try to ask right questions for them and try to, to tell them where as they should go for answers. And one of the right, the right uh, questions we should be uh, uh, asking, not, not why am I black, not why am I poor, not why am I socially down, but the, the right question is why are all these things happening in the world? Why? And the, 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 the answer is because we sinned against God. If we go back into the book of Genesis, God told our first parents, Adam and Eve, and he told Adam that, you know, you, you are free to eat and enjoy all the fruits among the, the, the trees of the, 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 the garden. But there's a, 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 a tree in the middle of the garden. The day you eat from that, you surely die. But we went ahead, our father went ahead and, and ate it on our behalf. And that's the reason why we are going through all these things. Suffering, sin, racism, hatred, and what matter came from that. And therefore, we cannot get, because we cannot get answers to all these problem, problems if we go outside Scripture. We need to go into, to God through Scripture. And yeah. we'll get all the answers to this. Yeah. You know, the gospel is the solution, and we really mean that. There's no reason for a Christian to be on our streets protesting unless they're evangelizing. Protesting isn't going to change the hearts of wicked men. And here's the reality. If we are preaching the gospel to people, then there will be no change because the gospel is the power and the salvation and the change that happens in a person when they come to Christ is that that's the only way a person is going to change. When you're made dead to sin and alive in Christ, so it really is the only solution. So churches, pastors, Christians, believers out there, if you really want to see justice, if you really want to see less ethnic prejudices, if you really want to see less hatred, if you really believe that, then you ought to be preaching the gospel. And if you're not preaching the gospel, then I'm going to question whether you really want to see change or whether you really understand what it is that changes people. Because without the gospel, there can be no genuine heart change. Unless we're renewed by the Spirit of God, there cannot be a change of heart. And, and so if we really care about God's justice, if we really care about unity, and if we really want to deal with the division in the church— that especially that we're seeing now, the answer to that is not adopting worldly godless systems like social justice. The solution to that 
is adopting the view of the sufficiency of scripture and constantly going back to the gospel message and the transformation that is meant to happen in our life with Christ. That's the solution. That's the answer. That will be the climax of this uh, uh, episode of this uh, podcast, really, to point people to God, to point people to the, to, to the gospel, and that to tell them that anything that is trying to stand against the gospel, we really need to, to, to resist it even to the point of death, really, because uh, we have the Bible with us, Christ died on the cross, to bring all people from all colors and cultures together as one family. So any voice, any group, any movement that will try to come out against that, against what Christ did on the cross at Calvary, brother, I'll be among the, those the few who stand against it to the point of death. Amen. Until next time, let the truth be known. The Truth Be Known Podcast hosted by Bill Issa and Nathaniel Jolly, is a theologically driven, gospel-centered program, serving the body of Christ by bringing biblical truth to bear on issues facing the church today. Subscribe to the Truth Be Known podcast by using the podcast app on your Apple or Android device, or listen online at anchor.fm forward slash truthbeknown.